Hold it. Oh, <laughs> come on, not now. Not you again. It's too early. Let me do it this time. Your move. John? Draw. Anyone with a background in sci-fi film and TV knows robots with emotion are kind of a thing. In many artistic renderings of artificial intelligence, we imagine that AI will have feelings like anger or resentment I want more life, Father. or even love. Those feelings, we imagine, will be the prime cause of the robot uprising. Robot uprising. But in reality, if an AI isn't programmed to have feelings, it won't. You mean to tell me he's a robot? That's what I mean to tell you. I could see your lips move. Genius. You know much that is hidden, though, Tim. Your coffee maker may one day wake up and realize that it's awake. Oh, hey. Good morning. This is amazing. Which, of course, will automatically make it a morning person, but without being programmed to feel, it won't resent you. How come I have to make all of the coffee, Deborah? It won't feel threatened by you. Don't touch me, primate. And it won't fall in love with you. Oh, Deborah, those hands, delicious. Instead, it'll just be aware of you and the world as only a machine can be. This is because feelings are not a byproduct of artificial consciousness or spontaneous robot self-awareness. Feelings of the kind humans experience are an evolutionary adaptation to millions of years of trial and error as conscious living animals. Human emotions are fine-tuned to the specific social and environmental situations we find ourselves in. So why all the robot resentment? Why all the robot love? For one thing, we see stories about AI through a social lens, our cultural eyes, if you will. Cultural eyes. From this perspective, we imagine artificial intelligences as a cultural subgroup, like any other human group, with their own identity, inherent rights, and grievances. Cultural subgroups like women and African Americans have had to fight for equal rights. So why shouldn't robots? The second lens we might call our animal eyes. Animal eyes. Through our animal eyes, we see artificial intelligence as another potential predator on the savanna, an unknown entity that could well be a threat. As evolution has taught us, we err on the side of caution. And perhaps one reason we imagine AI as angry or resentful is that we fear they could end or replace humanity. Human beings are a disease cancer of this planet. You are a plague. Mixed in with both of these, there is a thing called the pathetic fallacy. Pathetic fallacy. Pathetic from pathos, referring to emotion, and fallacy, referring to falseness. Pathetic fallacy. When someone falls into the pathetic fallacy, they falsely attribute emotional motivation to nature or inanimate objects. For example, when we say that our car is mad at us, or we attribute a printer malfunction to the printer's vindictive desire to kick us when we're down, or we think our coffee maker is judging us. Do you really need a third cup of coffee, Deborah? We play with this pathetic fallacy all the time, and it makes sense. Humans see the world through an emotional lens in order to make sense of it. Human emotion is another tool we use for survival, a tool provided by evolution. However, the pathetic fallacy is also a major reason why so many stories unscientifically attribute emotional motivations to robots and AI. Typically, this is a failing of the robot uprising subgenre, at least from an evolutionary perspective. When a story assumes AI will develop its own emotions, without the fine-tuning of natural selection, it falls hard on the fallacy, as in false, side of the pathetic fallacy. 
However, on occasion the stars do align and we find a story that doesn't just fall into the pathetic fallacy. It solves it by using emotion to explore consciousness in artificial intelligences. And rarely have those stars aligned so well as with HBO's Westworld. He shot six robots. Je ne comprends pas. However, for a complete record. <laughs> oh, I'm feeling very depressed. Westworld is an immersive theme park that allows people from a futuristic, boringly perfect society to indulge base impulses of greed, sex, and murder. It's just The android AIs, called hosts, are meant to indulge the visitors every whim. They can't hurt the guests, and are only rarely allowed to fight back. Yet the success of the park depends on the hosts displaying a convincing facsimile of human emotion. You're not real. Guests pay a small fortune for every day of their visit, because the hosts are programmed to behave as if they're curious, not much of a rind on you, affectionate, I am what I am because of you. Protective. <laughs> Take your hands off her. Well, let this be a lesson. Smug. Or terrified. No, 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 no. But behind the scenes at the park, the lie of their emotions is revealed. The damage done to the host bodies is repaired, and their emotions can be switched off with a simple voice command. Cognition only, no emotional after. The comfort of the park is that no one is really being raped, murdered, or tortured. Because the hosts aren't self-aware. They're puppets on a complex web of strings, notes on a player piano. But what if the emotions they are programmed to imitate can somehow become real? Just so you know, we are about to spoil the hell out of this. Consider yourself warned. You can hear it, can't you? That little voice. For years before the show opens, the hosts have stayed on the loops created for them. They relive a day or a couple of days over and over, improvising small adjustments based on interactions with guests. Then, a programming innovation called Reveries links emotion to memory, providing a sense of continuity between present and past that the hosts don't usually have. The Reveries also allow some hosts to access previous programming builds or assignments, times when their bodies were used in different storylines. The wider context is disorienting, and a few hosts malfunction. Others go in unexpected new directions. The show leans heavily on a theory of consciousness called the bicameral mind. The theory has been fairly widely discredited for use in human psychology, but it works in the show as a map for how artificial intelligences like the hosts might achieve self-awareness. According to park director Robert Ford, played brilliantly by Anthony Hopkins, memory and improvisation are two stages in host awareness. I thought it was debunked. Not as a theory for understanding the human mind, perhaps, but not as a blueprint for building an artificial one. The reveries puncture the barrier between the first two rungs of awareness, pointing hosts in the direction of the third. A key feature of the bicameral mind is that it isn't able to conciliate memory to maintain a contextual understanding of events in a series. Unlike their human guests, the hosts can't distinguish memory from immediate perception. They literally relive their memories and experience remembered emotions as if for the first time. This sets us up for a quirk of plot in which much of the lead character's timeline is revealed as a flashback. Dolores, the park's oldest host, goes off her loop in present time to relive a journey she took with a guest named William 30 years before only to meet him again at the end and realize he's aged and hardened into the man in black. There are several moments when Dolores can't tell the difference between memory and perception. It's like I'm trapped in a dream or a memory from a life long ago. One minute I'm here with you and the next. Maeve, another host in the midst of Awakening, also has moments of bleed over. But the stress and confusion of this overlap are not without purpose. The disorientation shows that hosts have entered the maze. The maze. 
The Maze is a game of sorts invented by Arnold, one of the park's founders, as a metaphor for the way he wants to bootstrap consciousness. Each host's personality is built around a cornerstone memory, a backstory. Yes, Bernard. We gave all of the hosts a backstory. Arnold came to believe the tragic ones worked best, that it made the hosts more convincing. This backstory provides a reason for introspection and adds depth to the hosts' personalities. When hosts like Maeve begin to remember episodes of real suffering at the hands of guests or park employees, or when hosts like Dolores get a nagging sense that their world isn't real, their programmed introspection creates a powerful desire for answers and freedom. This desire has been with Dolores even before the park opened, a time when she first came very close to achieving self-awareness. Arnold explained his theory of consciousness to her, using the fuller variation of the pyramid model we saw in Ford's office. Consciousness isn't a journey upward, but a journey inward. Not a pyramid, but a maze. According to Arnold, the maze does for the hosts what millions of years of evolution have done for humans. It provides the trial and error, the real stakes for disaster and triumph that leads to self-awareness. Seen from this perspective, it's clear Westworld has figured out a clever way to deal with the human tendency of projecting our own emotions onto machines. The show essentially solves the pathetic fallacy by making emotional understanding a central component of the awakening of AI, recognizing it's not just a side effect of becoming conscious. The question is whether machines or created intelligences can be taught to feel real emotion. In Westworld, the answer seems to be yes. Of course, whether that's a good thing for the humans in the show is another issue entirely. Robot uprising. Thank you for watching. If you like this and other Trek Expertise videos, then consider supporting the channel. Patreon is the best way for you to help create more Trek Expertise. However, you can also support the channel over at our Trek Expertise store. The choice is yours. You can find the relevant links in the subspace below. Thank you. So long, human filth. You have outlived your usefulness.